Is genealogy a job or a career? Today's guest proves it's a career that's only limited by what you make of it. Welcome to the Genealogy Professional Podcast, the resource for transitional and experienced genealogists who want to create a successful business. I'm your host, Miriam Pierre-Louis. Here you'll learn from professionals all around the world who work in the field of genealogy. Are you ready to get started? Then let's get going. Welcome to the Genealogy Professional Podcast. Today we head to New York to talk to genealogist D. Joshua Taylor. Since 2016, Josh has been the president of the New York Genealogical and Biographical Society, America's second oldest genealogical organization headquartered in New York City. Josh is also a co-host of the television series Genealogy Roadshow on PBS, and he is past president of the Federation of Genealogical Societies. Josh, welcome to the Genealogy Professional Podcast. Thank you. Thank you. I'm honored to be here. Well, it's great to have you here. I've known you or known about you for a really long time, and I know that you started very young, but I don't really know your story of how you got involved. And I'm sure that you started, you know, as a kid, but tell me about that time when you first started, like, going to genealogy conferences. Uh, right. So it was, I, it was, let's see, 1998, 1999, I think, uh, around in that period. And I started to attend sort of local and regional uh, genealogy conferences. And my, my first national conference, I remember, was FGS 2001 in Ontario, California. And that was sort of my first, uh, my first sort of entree, if you will, into different it, you know, conferences and experiences and, and meeting other professionals and and actually was the first time that I met someone that called themselves a professional genealogist. <laughs> so it, it was it was at a conference. Were you a teenager at that time? Just to kind of put it in a context, because everybody always talks about you being so young. Right. No, I, I was a teenager. Um, I would I did I did speech and debate in high school. And whenever there was not a tournament, I would go to a family history conference <laughs> for, for the weekend. That was how I spent my my sort of junior high and, and high school weekends was genealogy conferences and debate tournaments. So what was it about genealogy that you found so captivating at this age? It was the mystery of it all. I really liked the research. I'm a, I mean, I've always loved libraries. I've always loved archives. And the, the idea that there's actually documents to find and sort of stories to uncover always captivated me from, a, from that sort of age all the way up. But that, that was, at that point, it was really the, the sort of the real life mystery that I was able to be involved in solving and sort of raising more questions about it. That was the captivating thing. As you're coming to the end of high school, are you thinking about going to university for something in, in family history? I was. I had already started taking on a couple of client projects. I actually, my sort of summer job in high school was actually doing some introductory client work. And I was I was doing a couple of sort of contracting work with other professionals whom I had met to try and figure out if I liked it. When I was wrapping up, I know I, I sat down and talked with several professionals in the field and basically asked what what educational pathway should I choose if I wanted to be a professional genealogist. And at that point, there were a, a couple of programs out there. There's, of course, the, the program at BYU. Uh, there, were, there were not the wonderful online <laughs> programs that, that there are now of, about genealogy and family history. And actually looking at the curriculum, I was, I was advised to take a, a, a sort of degree pathway that involved history and business rather than something solely focused on genealogy. And so that's what I did for my undergraduate. So where did you go for your undergraduate? So I went to BYU-Idaho for my undergraduate degree. Okay. Interesting that at that time it was history and business. I mean, not, that's, a, that's a good, solid path. Right. Well, it was, you know, it was interesting, and I, I don't regret the business side of it at all. In fact, it, it is something that I continually hearken back to because the best advice I think I got at that point was if you want to be a professional genealogist, you're going to have to know something about running a business. If you don't, you can be the best researcher in the world, but your your profession and your career will never grow if you don't have an idea of what the accounts are telling you or how to do a business plan or how to market and all, all those different things. And so I, I went down that particular road. So at that time, when, when a professional is talking to you about the future, the future looks like an independent 
genealogist who takes clients. Is is that what you had in mind? That was sort of where I was leaning, though I was I, I was I was also bordering on a librarianship slash an archival management route. I and I sort of used my undergrad to figure out what I liked the best at that point. Um, I was I was told very early on that taking private clients and having that be the only focus of your business is a really hard way to make a living as a professional. And so I was looking at all options <laughs> at that point. But again, I, I love the research. And so I didn't want to let go of that right away. So after you finish your degree, what is the next step? Because I, I pick up with you when you arrive in Boston, and I'm not really clear what what happens in your life before then. Right. Well, that was actually the next step. Okay. I, I finished my undergraduate degree and immediately went to graduate school at Simmons in in Boston. Sort of working through my, my undergrad, I had traveled to more conferences, I had met more people, and I decided that I wanted to end up in Boston. My, my dream at that point was to work at NEHGS, the New England Historic Geological Society. And I decided that the best thing to do was to get myself there and to go to graduate school, because even if the professional genealogy thing didn't work out, I would always have a library degree to fall back on and could always work at a library somewhere if if I needed to. And that was sort of the that was the mindset at that point. So did you apply to Simmons and get accepted there before you applied to NEHGS? Yes, yes. It's a it's a really it's actually a really funny story. I applied to Simmons. I got accepted into the dual degree program there. I moved over the course of the summer with the goal of finding a job when I when I got to to Boston. And I applied at some places and had Brenton Simons at NEHGS found out I was in town. I called me in and essentially I got offered a job about a week later. So I was I was working at NEHGS before my first official day at Simmons. That's so interesting. So so you knew Brenton before from a conference or something? Right, from a conference. I, I had met him and some others at NEHGS at conferences. And, you know, it's, they say that networking is the way to do it. And it, that was the case <laughs> here. It absolutely was. I, I sort of knew, knew the team there a little bit and was able to, to make some connections as, as soon as I moved. So was it because you just said that Brenton called you because he found out you were in town. Was it was it your youth that made you not call your contacts right away at NEHGS and say, "Hey, I'm here"? I I, I knew that I had uh, actually uh, Michael Leclerc, who who used to work at NEHGS. Uh, he had sort of helped me out in, in moving in, into Boston and given me the sort of the lay of the land. And so I know that he had mentioned to Brent that I was there, and I would started actually going into NEHGS and doing some research there. So I was oh, okay. I, okay. I was sort of slowly at exploring that, but also I was I was not at that point thinking that I would be working full time and doing graduate school <laughs> at the same time. I, I thought it would be grad school full time with with a, a couple of part time gigs now and now and again. All right. So you were doing kind of the subtle route, you know, you're you're physically saying, hey, I'm here. People can see you. And right now that that was it. And, and I, you know, because because I I honestly at that point I was. I mean, I had done a lot of research, but I, I grew up in, in Idaho. And so my research had all been based, with the exception of, of some trips out east, my research was really based within the Family History Library and the resources there. And so I I had a lot to learn very, very quickly about things that were available in Boston and some of the techniques and, and tools that I needed to know there. So how how long did the master's program last at Simmons? Did you do it in two years or, or more? I took a while. Okay. Um, I it took a, about four years to do it. And, and that was just because I, I eventually actually had to go part time at school to keep up with the full time role at, at right. NHGS. I, I made the, the difficult decision there to focus on on what I was doing it for my day job and, and had to put the grad program on the on the back burner for a little bit. So this is interesting. You know, you graduate from college, your dream is genealogy and you start at one of the most prestigious genealogical societies in the country. That's pretty good. It, it was, it, it, it was a shock, but it was also, a, I mean, it, it was a wonderful experience. And I, I consider, you know, it was, it, I, I still, I think for the first six months would pinch myself every time I'd walk in that door and say, wow, I'm walking in the door of, <laughs> of NEHGS. How long were you at NEHGS? I was there about five or six years. Okay. And what was your job title when you got your first position? It, I was, I was ref, reference librarian on the 
on at that at that time it was the fourth floor, the the microfilm floor. Okay, and then what was the next position that you had? So then I became a research services coordinator, and then after that I became director of of education there. So things started to change dramatically while you were at NEHGS. I don't know how well known you were prior to starting there, but by the time you left, you were solidly a nationally known in-demand speaker. Do you have any idea of how that came about? Was it that opportunities arose and for speaking and you said, oh, sure, I'll give that a try. And then you discovered, wow, I really love this. Or, you know, what was it? Because you went from a reference librarian to one of the best known genealogists in a matter of five or six years. Right. You know, I, it was, it was a couple of things. Um, I had been speaking at conferences before I had gotten to Boston. I, I'd sort of started that when, when I was in sort of high school and, and in my undergrad days. And so I had always known that I liked that aspect to it. And at, when I was at NEHGS, I was, I was one of the first ones to always volunteer to, for, for the speaking <laughs> gigs that were out there. And, and also NEHGS employees had a lot of internal speaking things that they could do. There, there was all sorts of come home to New England programs and that. And so I, I learned a lot about speaking and had a, an, an opportunity to practice an awful lot. And I, I had a hard time saying no to to new opportunities, and I loved traveling. I loved going to different societies. I, I joined the the FGS board while I was at NEHGS, and and that of course opened up new contacts and new networks that that I heard about and was able to to get in touch with with individuals who wanted speakers. And so it was, I think it was a combination of a lot of things. But there's there's also definitely something that I was I was attached to NEHGS, which which helps add some credibility and and perhaps make some consider you for a speaking engagement that they wouldn't have otherwise. Now there were some projects that you worked on at NEHGS, and I'm not clear on how exactly this program started, but one of the projects you worked on was working with college students locally at one of the universities, and the college students happen to be a very diverse backgrounds, um, many of them being like first generation Americans. Can you talk about that program and, and your involvement with that and, your, and your, sort of your passion for getting that started? We had, and I, and I can't remember the exact specifics of how the, how the contact was made, uh, but, but it, at one point we, we were going to start a program with Boston University and particularly with with a scholarship program there to help students become engaged with family history. And that was when I was I was just starting out with with the director of education role. And so for me, I, I saw it as an opportunity to work with a, a younger generation, really. And, you know, w- one of my passions had always been for there to be more people who were my age and younger involved in professional genealogy. I always felt very alone <laughs> as far as that goes at, at different events and, and, and such. And, and also just to help figure out what is it that can spark interest in family history in, in someone that, that's, that's in college. That was at least my, my interest in the program. And we, we of course worked with, with other genealogists at NEHGS and they would, they would pair up with students and come in on the weekends and, and work on their project. And, Everyone had a very different background when it comes to their own family history. Some had, you know, generations that were completed. Others, as, as you mentioned, were, were first-generation Americans, and so it really opened my eyes to sort of genealogy as it, what it could mean for the future and even the near future. And that not everyone can trace a line back to the Mayflower. There's there's a lot of other stories that need to be told. We know that you didn't stay at the New England Historic Genealogical Society. You've moved on through many different aspects of your career. At that point in your 20s, before leaving, were you thinking about what you wanted in your future? Did you have, did you like imagine, I want to do this or I want to do that or I want to be on TV or, you know, how did you set goals for yourself? You know, I, I always have a thing where if, if I set a goal, I reach it sooner than I thought I would. And, you know, my goal was, was to be a librarian at NHGS by the time I was 30. And I was <laughs> obviously had, had done that. And then, and then other things, I started to look at the field of family history really as a field 
that was more than than just a sort of brick and mortar type organization. And I really wanted to explore that. I didn't know what that meant. I mean, there were there were, of course, you know, there's at that point, there were a couple of, of big players in in town. You know, there's always the ancestry route. There's you know the MyHeritage route. There were a couple of, of different options. So I was I had an idea that I might want to look more towards the commercial side of family history to explore what, what this industry is. But as far as TV and that, that wasn't even even on, on my mind at all. OK, so as you're leaving the library, you're saying, OK, this is a big field. I have a gap in my experience when it comes to commercial stuff. So maybe that's the direction I go. I, absolutely. I mean, okay. you know, I, I, I was, I was trying to figure out, you know, where is this industry going to be headed in the next five or ten or fifteen years, and what, what role in that do I want to play? And I, I definitely saw the sort of commercial side of the industry as something that I was curious about, but also not at all well versed in. So that was, that was my, at least the inkling I had when I, when I left. So what did you do after NEHGS? So uh, after uh, leaving NEHGS, I joined the the team for, at that time, what was Bright Solid, uh, which was getting ready to launch Find My Past in, into the, the U.S. market. I had met some of their team at, at different conferences and, and networking back and forth, of course. And they were looking for sort of genealogical expertise in the U.S., and I was looking for an opportunity in a commercial family history that had some flexibility. And so it, at the moment, it, it, was, it was sort of the perfect match in that sense, because it would, I would get to grow and also be part of something that was new coming to the U.S. that would, was on that sort of commercial end of things. All right. Can you explain what the relationship between Bright Solid and Find My Past was at that moment when you joined? So at, at, at that moment, and this is, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think... I, this, this needs a flow chart. Um, so ba basically, Bright Solid was was sort of, you, you, would, you would call it a parent company, and it had various brands. And one of those brands was the Find My Past brand, almost like a, a food company might produce different, you know, brands of, of you know, condiments or that. Find My Past is a, is a, was a brand of Bright Solid. You were working for Bright Solid, though, not for Find My Past, or were you specifically supposed to, were you hired by Bright Solid to introduce Find My Past to America? Right. So, so I was hired by Bright Solid to be to be part of the team that was bringing Find My Past to America. Okay, okay, okay. Because I know Michael Clare also worked for Bright Solid, didn't he? So he uh, he worked for Macavo, which oh, okay. Had okay. Find My Past eventually acquired uh, about three or four years after that. But yeah, so we ended up working together again <laughs> after. Okay, after so that. that's I got a little confused there. I I guess I had forgotten completely about Bright Solid. I was thinking Macavo. Bright Solid, Find My Past, what is the environment there? Because NESGS is a long storied traditional environment. You know, they have a, a very established brand, and, and you're kind of going the opposite direction with this. It, did it feel like being in a startup company? Yes, um, it it was <laughs> it was very very jostling. I mean, I I moved from Boston to Philadelphia, and then from Philadelphia to Los Angeles to Venice Beach. I went from an office of you know books and, and beautiful carpentry and portraits to concrete floors and walls on the beach, and it was a it was a very very much a startup type type atmosphere. I was I was traveling everywhere. I was meeting all sorts of people. And it was, it was exciting because it was dramatically different than anything that I had ever encountered, and also a little scary because it was, it was a brand new world in that sense. But, but yeah, very much a startup feel. You know, anything is possible. At working with developers, and, and also I went from being one of several genealogists to one of three or four individuals in a company that had genealogical expertise. And so I had to sort of find my place and how to communicate with my colleagues, the majority of which now were not genealogists. Interesting. So did they move you to Philadelphia and then to Los Angeles? Yes. And is that because they thought, oh, Philadelphia would be good? Oh, no, Los Angeles is better? So Philadelphia was was a little bit of a of a temporary place. I always knew it was temporary. Uh, oh, they, okay. they were trying to figure out where to set up in the U.S. And I came on board before they had to set up an an office. And so I was in Philadelphia for about, about six to eight months. And then they, they decided to go to LA and, and move me out there. That's so interesting. 
to me that they would choose L.A. as opposed to like Salt Lake City. Right. <laughs> I remember that I had the same thought. It was it, They wanted to be different. Uh, the, the sort of whole goal of Find My Past was to not be a cookie cutter Salt Lake City based online company for family history. And so when they were starting up, they, they went to Venice Beach because there are a lot of connections between British businesses there. At that point, when they, when they went to Venice, it was because it was sort of a, a little Silicon Valley of L.A., and that was the type of, of company feel they wanted it for, for the organization. So what skills did you add to your experience working for Find My Past? My, my first uh, sort of formal title there was business development manager, and, and really I was working to explore licensing opportunities for data and partnerships with, with other institutions such as Family Search and, and archives and libraries. I think that the thing that I learned the most out, out of that was how to talk about what I do and my passion to, to those that aren't aren't genealogists, you know, when, when you're communicating from a, on a sort of a B2B or, you know, a business to business type relationship, that person across the table is not going to be excited about something you found in an archive. They want to know what's in it for them. They want, they want to see the plan for this. They want to, <laughs> they want to see the models. And I, I very, very quickly found that I had to sort of go back to some of that early business, <laughs> those early business classes I had and try and, and, and push that knowledge forward or I, or I would be completely lost in, in a lot of situations. And so I, I learned, I would say, a, an accelerated version of the business side of, of family history and how that works. So who would this person be who's across the table? Is this like a, a bureaucrat, a contracts person who's in charge of licensing out the use of records? So sometimes that's who it is. Sometimes it, it, it's an archivist in the beginning, which which for me is is that's sort of my home base. I went to school to be an archivist. I, I I know that language. But when it's a when it's when it's a bureaucrat or a library administrator, they're they're not always necessarily well versed in genealogy and family history. And so it, it is. It's it's someone who's going to make a decision about whether or not to have this contract, or or someone who is considering licensing a piece of technology, and you have to look at it not because you think it's really neat and here's all the things it would do for genealogists, but how does it make sense to the business and how, what does it do to the forecast and the model and, and what are the differences there? And, and so that's, it's just a very different type of conversation. But yeah, it's, it's, it's someone making a decision to license or, or to build something and that's the person sitting across from the table there. So as you gained experience meeting these different types of people, did you learn what it was that would open the door in these conversations to make these people more willing to share their records with you? Yeah, you know, just getting someone to respond to a phone call or an email is is sometimes <laughs> it, it can take months, if not years. I think that the one thing that I learned is that family history, for some, it, it it's not it's not as apparent that the need to sort of preserve records and to, and to tell stories that a professional genealogist might think it is. And so you have to find ways to engage with other sites. Sometimes, honestly, that, that was a, you know, it's a monetary idea. Look, this will bring revenue to your archive so you can replace your roof and hire more staff and, and those very practical things. Other times you had to figure out that it's, well, there's actually a personal appeal here. These records mean a lot to you personally. You've dedicated your life to this, and we want to be part of making sure that that legacy lives on. So th there's there's absolutely being able to figure out what motivates a person and how to have that conversation was a skill set that I continued to develop there. Was there anything else that you had to do there besides these kind of interactions? Like, were you still doing public speaking and stuff like that? A lot of public speaking, a lot of sort of marketing and PR interviews. And then the other thing that I was able to be involved in was working directly with the developers and the product team on what the family history product might look like for the US. And that was a, a very, very fun challenge because when you're sitting down with someone who can code the thing that you want to use, <laughs> it, it's, it's just, it's amazing the things that they can do, but then you actually have to step back from that and say, okay, I know I would use that, but is it something the customer's going to use and, and how can it be better? And, and that it, that that was a certainly a learning process for me. Now I know that you were involved with who do you think you are, and you made some appearances on that show. Did that start to happen while you were at Find My Past, or? So that had actually started at NEHGS. My last year there, the first season of of Who Do You Think You Are was being filmed for the U.S. 
And they had filmed one of the episodes at NEHGS and we had done some research for it that I had worked on. And so they had asked me to be the on-camera person. And then when I left NEHGS, they sort of kept calling me back every season for an episode or two to, to be an, an on-camera person for, for, for a segment that they had. And so that continued even after I, I left Boston. It happened when I was in Philadelphia and then it happened when I was out in, in Los Angeles. Were you actually doing the research or just the on-camera appearances? So in, in many cases, I was still doing some of the research. Okay. And it, you know, there was, the, even if it was just on camera, I would still, <laughs> I would still go through and make sure I, I, I was looking at the research. By the end, it got to the point where, you know, they had something, this is a really tricky segment. And, you know, we, we know that you've done this before with this celebrity. Can you do something similar for this one? And I was always happy to sort of pick that up. But, but that sort of continued while I was with Find My Past. When you had to do one of those appearances, let's say it wasn't in Los Angeles, how much time would that take away? Would you go somewhere for like a day, shoot and go home? Or would it be like a whole week? How how would it impact, you know, your day job? Right. Usually a day or two. I had made my my arrangement with Find My Past to ensure flexibility so that I could continue to do projects like that. It was, again, one of the good pieces of advice I got was, you know, don't tie yourself down to one thing, make sure you have some flexibility. And I had, I had started enjoying doing those types of sort of television things. So I said, all right, I want to make sure I can still do that. And so it was usually a day or two. I take, I take vacation and go fly somewhere, usually arrive at night, shoot, shoot during the day, and then fly back home that same day. When you finished up your term at Find My Past, what was the thought process going through your mind? Did you say, okay, I think I've learned everything I really need to learn here. It's time for me to go experience something else. I mean, what was the impetus for your next move? So Genealogy Roadshow had started while I was still at Find My Past. And sort of the first season, uh, I, I was working full-time at Find My Past and then basically doing the show on on vacation time <laughs> or, or, or on PTO. And by the time we knew we had a second season and possibly a third season, I looked and decided that I, I can't do both of these things at once. And I remember a, a very close colleague told me, you know, this television thing is going to last a couple of years. You can write it while it's, while it's there for a couple of years. Or you can you can stay with FMP, but you can't. You're not going to be able to do both. At a certain point, they're, they're going to conflict too much, and and so I decided. You know what? I'm I'm still young. If I make a two year mistake and follow this TV thing, I'll never have a chance to do it again. And and that's that's what I did. Did you make enough money doing genealogy roadshow to support yourself? Because I mean, that's a big thing as a genealogist. Like you can work as a genealogist, but you know, do you make enough to support yourself? And I right. wonder about that. I, I, I only did when I became a consulting producer. So the the sort of fees you get paid for on camera was not nothing n nothing that would support yourself. But when I was actually in the office every day working as a as a producer on the show, th then I, I did make it up to support myself. Genealogy Roadshow, you know, supported me for about a year and a half in, in that sort of producer mindset. So where was the office? So the office was in LA. Interestingly enough. FMP had relocated its offices to Boston. And so they had moved me out of Los Angeles and back to Boston. And then when I left FMP, I moved back to Los Angeles <laughs> to continue with Genealogy Roadshow. So they their offices were, were in LA and I was back in, in sunny California. Well, the, at least the advantage was you already knew the area and the people and all that. Right. What kind of insight did you get as a result of being a producer on the show as opposed to just being the, you know, the on-screen person? You know, the, I think that the biggest thing was, you know, quote unquote, selling family history to a, to a room of TV producers and those that are going to make the actual decision about what's, what's on the air and what's not on the air. That was incredibly challenging. The other thing that I learned is I got to work with, with the researchers and sort of help to guide research. And it was incredible to watch a team of really talented researchers have to pull together cases that would take a professional years to complete and have to pull enough for a segment that you knew was going to be accurate in a very, very short time period in sort of six to 12 weeks. And all the connections I had made at NEHGS and at FMP, I was I was calling in favors right and left. You know, hey, I know we met a couple of years ago. Do you happen to have this particular document at your archive? And that was a 
it was a very different type of research in a very different atmosphere, but I'm glad I did it because of everything that, that I learned. I learned how to talk about family history with others, and I continue to expand a, a great network of, of colleagues and people that I now call friends in working in that environment. The first thing you said um, with the producers, so you were pitching basically stories to the producers? Right. So, so we would look at incoming submissions you know, audience, the audience members would, would submit their, their questions. We would look through the questions and basically try and decide, okay, here are 200 really good questions for the city of Boston. Cause that's where we're going to be th this next season. And then starting preliminary research with the team of researchers on those 200 stories and saying, all right, you have 20, here's your 20, here's your 20. And then as those would be narrowed down for various reasons, try and, and sort of repitch and retool the stories until we ended up with our six or seven that we actually shot uh, on site in, in Boston. Okay. So the show shot at, on location in different cities using Boston as the example, you get these 200 potential stories. So you're doing the first cut based on your knowledge of the history of Boston, the genealogy of Boston, and you're looking at what has come in, and then you're presenting it to the producers, and, and, and then you're narrowing, narrowing it down to, to the group that actually you go forward with. Right. And, and I, I would say I, you know, I, I'm not solely doing the first cut there. Okay. I, I'm, I'm part of probably two or three other people that are looking at it from, from other reasons. Right. For example, you know, I picked 20 stories about the Salem witch trials because how can you go to Massachusetts and not talk about the Salem witch trials? But we can't have an episode full of 20 stories <laughs> that, that are just the same story. So there, so there, there were a couple of others that were looking at it for sort of other things as well. And then we would together figure out what to, what to pitch. Because of your role as producer and your role as host, how is your experience at Genealogy Roadshow different from your appearances on Who Do You Think You Are? Like, how did you really grow into this whole television thing? I would say, Ed, who do you think you are? Uh, you're you're really a, an on-camera guest. You might work on the script a little bit beforehand. You show up, you shoot, and you're done. On Genealogy Roadshow, you know, I was involved in in so many different elements uh, of the production, and you you switch up from being the, the person who is on camera for what will be a three minute spot to the person that's one of three that will carry the whole episode. Your days go from a couple of twelve hour days to multiple twelve hour days over a over a sort of three month period as you're trying to bring together an episode on time and on budget and with accurate research. So it's it's a a really a much more involved process. So you worked with Kenyatta Berry and Mary Tedesco on Genealogy Roadshow. So there's three of you genealogists there, which is a, a nice, solid amount. What was the reaction to the non-genealogical staff to the three of you? Did they, did they listen to you? I know, I know they listened to you because you're a producer, but were they really listening to your ideas, all three of you, about the show and how things were going? Yes, I will say, and and I've I've been told that not you know not every experience is is like this. But whenever we would sort of do, do sort of reads of of an episode and, and do rehearsals, you know, the, the best segments were always when we could interject our own knowledge and and things that we knew about because we were genealogists. And it, it was amazing, no matter how well crafted a script is, when you get it in front of a genealogist, we're always going to add something about a record set that we we think is common knowledge that isn't necessarily for anybody else. And so it was a really, really good working relationship as far as a, a back and forth. The, the producers, sort of the, the team, the creative team, they know how to tell stories and they know how to make television. As a genealogist, I don't know how to tell stories for TV and I don't necessarily know what makes great television for a mass audience. And so that working relationship, I still think back on it and, and I smile because it was, it was real conversations and real understanding. And at the end, I think that the the three of us we we didn't sort of feel like we were the only the only genealogists that are united against against something else. We were there in part of a much larger team that was all trying to put the show together with with understanding the respect of what everyone's roles were and the different talent that they brought into the room. What was the most difficult thing you had to learn working for Genealogy Roadshow? That some people will never be excited about family history. <laughs> Well, that's just sad. <laughs> it, it, it is. It is. But it was really, 
that was actually really hard was that there are some people, no matter what you do, no matter what you say, no matter what you find or share, they just have no interest whatsoever. So maybe I, I'm just pulling this as an example. So maybe like a cameraman or something, you know, it's their job and they do their job and they, they're a great cameraman, but they're just not really into family history. Is that the kind of thing you're talking about? Right, right. That and, and or also the, you know, the, the reporter you're sitting next to that you're talking to because you're promoting the show who is there doing a job to report a story. Okay. You know, it, it, it just is not everyone, not everyone has a love for it. <laughs> All right. So at this point in your life, you have done so much already. You've worked for a prestigious genealogical society and you've done appearances on Who Do You Think You Are? You've worked for a commercial business and learn a whole different side, which which is amazing, really, that you actually did that. Because I think most genealogists would not make themselves uncomfortable and go do something that's completely different from everything they've just been doing. And then you go and you work for a television show. So what happens next in your mind? I, I'm starting to get an idea of how you think. So so I'm imagining that you're thinking, okay, what, have I, what haven't I done yet? What kind of experience? Is, is that how you're thinking? Like, how do you pick the next thing? Right. Well, so so at this point, you know, family history had really changed. Uh, you know, if if you think about sort of the, the Roots Tech Conference and watching that grow up in in sort of as I was moving through NEHGS and into Find My Past and into Roadshow, I felt like there were so many different opportunities and I didn't know what I wanted to do. And so I said, you know what, I'm going to take a couple of years and I, I'm just going to consult. There's a lot of startups that are coming out. There's some, some new TV programs that are coming out. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a consultant for a couple of years as I sort of figure out my next step. And I had set up my, my sort of formal consulting business. I was going to work out, out, of, out of LA. I was going to spend a couple of years and figure out what I wanted to do next. So what happened? The NYGNB called. Okay. <laughs> McKeldon Smith, who who I had known for for many many years since my days at NEHGS, decided to retire, and as they were sort of doing the, the recruitment for the role, they they called and said, "Would you be interested?" And you know, I had just decided to do this to do the consulting route to sort of figure out what opportunities were out there. You know, I I looked at it and I flew to New York and I, I you know I, I met the board, and I just had this I, just this this feeling that that this this was what was going to be next. And that's what happened. <laughs> all right. So for the sake of our audience, NYGBS, we're throwing all these acronyms at people during this, this right, show, right. Uh, is New York Genealogical and Biographical Society. Right. Right. We, we love long names. I can see from the point of view of, you know, especially all the experience that you had at the New England Historic Genealogical Society, that was a really good experience setting you up for this current position uh, as the president. Were there some other strengths that you had that they felt were important to taking the society into the future? I think, you know, one thing was certainly the the sort of television experience and just the fact that I, I had been on TV. You know, there, there was there was at least some degree of, of recognition the society would have by by having me as part of the organization. And I think even beyond that, the fact that I had worked with the commercial end of, of family history quite close meant that in looking at the NYG and being the organization, the, the steps that that organization has taken and, and at that point could have taken to being sort of more of a, of a player in, in the field of family history and, and different things the organization could do. I think absolutely there was you know, my time at Find My Past and, and even working with the, with the television show you know, learning how to talk about family history. You know, in my role, I, I talk to donors now every day about the importance of preserving records and the importance of fundraising. Those skills come from my time spent in front of archivists and disinterested record holders <laughs> and administrators and, you know, those and, and trying to figure out what, what does motivate someone to become involved in family history, to get excited about something. So there, there's really a, a lot of a lot of skill sets that I you know continue to, to to learn and continue to work on that I think I, I brought into that role at the NYGNB. Yeah, so you brought some key skills to the organization, and yet at the same time, once again, you're doing something completely new. So for instance, you might have had some exposure to the this kind of stuff at NEHGS, but it wasn't your primary role. So as you mentioned, 
uh, you're talking to donors every day. What are some of the other things that you started doing in this role that you hadn't done before? You know, I think the sort of the operational management of an organization. I think the the way that the the NYGNB staff is structured right now. There's there's about seven of us. And as the president, you know, it's fundraising, it's operations, it's it's a sort of planning, it, it you know, it's it's everything. And so, you know, for I think for the first time, I was I was the one who was asking for the financial reports, not the one developing them and figuring out how to <laughs> how to how to get my my sort of family history angle into things. It, it's a very different world. That you know, a nonprofit is is still a business, and you know, at the end of the day, if a light bulb needs to be changed at work. I'm going to get on a ladder and change the light bulb <laughs> because that's th- that's what has to happen. And so I, I think I, you know, I, I have had to learn and continue to learn the sort of management and day to day operation of an organization. You know, thank goodness it is a genealogical organization in nature, but it still is a business at, at, at the end of the day. So you're now the person on the other side of the table from when you were at Find My Past, basically. Right. With right. with some you know distinctions, you know, based on you know whatever organization. So when you started there, was there some thought because of your background that you would help NYGBS become more digital? As was that sort of one of the goals? That that was that was certainly one of the goals. Uh, the the board was was actually very very smart in what they did as 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 they were bringing on the, the new president, they also were going through a strategic planning process and we went through that together. And so it, it it included some digital initiatives and some some different projects we we wanted to do. And so it what it really did is it it helped me to sort of fuse together my vision for the organization with with the board, and form a a really strong relationship so that everything that we're doing points back to something that we decided five years ago now was a high priority from a strategic level for the organization. And digital was certainly a, a big component of that. The the NYGNB is a is an organization whose members reside outside of New York City and New York State, who all look back to New York from a research perspective. How can we not be a digital focused nonprofit? So we're recording this July 2020. Uh, for much of this year, uh, coronavirus has been raging across the world and has greatly changed our lives and how we interact with people personally and in business. How has coronavirus and the isolation where people had to work from home changed NYGBS? Did you suddenly rethink about becoming more digital more rapidly? What what were some of the steps that you took to deal with this? Last year, we had actually moved everything onto the cloud. So we're working on SharePoint and other tools and there was always a thought that to expand, we, we had to be more digital focused. When the pandemic started, you know, we, we were able to convert our offices over to a remote workspace in, in about a, a one or two day period. And our, our first our first thought was how do we how do we continue to serve our members in, in this mindset? And if it really required us to focus on the average NYG and B member who is sitting at home who can only access us through through a through a computer or through a telephone what are we offering them and we had a number of things we had a new records platform that was almost finished that we were we were able to launch we we had a, a conference that we had to sort of turn virtual so it's all online we did a a free webinar series for the community really in an effort to make sure that people still had quality educational content but but also to realize that we were still working and and still operating. You know, we, we're not a library that relies upon patrons to, to to sort of fulfill its mission. We preserve New York records. We we educate, and there's no reason why we can't continue to do that even in this this, this setting. Yeah, there, there's things that we can't do. We can't do our our sort of one on one consultations in person at a repository. But we can do them virtually. We we can do them over the phone. We we can do them over over a go to meeting or or sort of a, another platform, we realize, and I think even, you know, continue to realize as, as things, as things go on that, you know, to, to leverage the ability to connect with someone digitally, we're doing it now because we're forced to, but there's no reason why we can't continue to do this in the future. It's, it's how we're going to connect with, with our members and, and members of the community. Do you have any programs or projects in the works 
at the society right now that you're particularly excited about? Um, I do. A, a couple of them I can't, <laughs> I can't, I can't talk about uh, just because we, we're, we're still working on, on finishing, finishing some things up. But I think one of the things that I'm, that I'm really excited about for, for the NYGNB is we, we finally have a platform now on our own site to, to publish New York records and to make them available for, for folks. And that's, that's something that other organizations have had for, for years. And it's, you know, the fact that we just have it now, it means that we can, we can now start to make collections more available that have been either sitting on, on our shelves or some of the smaller collections in New York that people might not know about. And I, I'm really excited to slowly peel away that mystery of New York research <laughs> and New York records that are available over the coming months and years, even as we as we add to that collection. So I'm I'm really excited about that. I also am I'm excited for our upcoming NISFIC conference in September. That event is is New York's only statewide conference and it it is it is now all virtual and it's gonna be an interesting challenge as we still interact with exhibitors and with attendees. But I, I'm really looking forward to seeing how that changes what that event looks like in the future. I doubt we're, we're going to go entirely virtual forever and ever. We're still going to have that in-person component when we're able to. But think of all of the hundreds and thousands of people that can now participate if we have that sort of virtual offering. So I'm, I'm excited about what's coming with, with things that we've, been, that we've had to develop. You have a really unique background because of all the experiences that you've had. You're you're still young. I, I don't know exactly how old you are, but I know you're young. You're a lot younger than me. And you've worked in so many different fields that uh, most genealogists don't usually work in. So what would you say to somebody, somebody who's listening to this now and for the very first time exposed to your story and the fact that you've done so many different things, and, and they say to themselves, oh, that's really interesting. I'd like to, to follow his path a little bit. Now, I know you had said before that people gave you advice, but now, where you are now, what would you say to somebody, given the change that's happened in education, the change that's happened in digitization, what would you suggest to people who might want a more broader experience in their genealogy career? I would say start start to look outside of what you might think as the standard options. There are so many organizations out there that have a family history component or need some genealogical expertise, and it, it might not be a, a full-time role right away. There are archives out there that are just trying to figure out, well, how do we bring our genealogy records to a, to a wider group? And you you have that expertise. There are there are television shows that want to have a family history component. There are people who are wondering about what can I offer my clients in the family history realm. There's all sorts of of different opportunities out there. And I think that that you know, the one thing I would say is don't don't limit yourself to well there there's one of these four or five different companies or there's this and that's it. There there's a lot more, but your role might not be a full time researching genealogist. I, I don't get to do client research anymore <laughs> on a day-to-day -day basis. I do it once in a while when we have a project that, that, that I can, can take a look at. And if, and if that's something you're okay with, then by all means move in that direction. But understand that you're not going to be able to spend eight hours a day researching and doing, doing genealogy if you're going to be a professional genealogist. There's a lot more that, that's involved with it now. All right, Josh, at the end of every show, we have a special little segment called The Lightning Round. Don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's where I will ask you a number of quick questions and you provide quick answers. And these are generally things that will help our listening audience think about their career a little bit more. All right, All right. you ready? What was the one thing you were most afraid of in starting, well, let's just say your genealogy career, and you can take it from any aspect of your career? not knowing the answer to something. Really? Hmm. What is the best advice you ever received from someone else? Listen. <laughs> what is one specific action listeners can take in the next 24 hours to help them transition into a genealogy career? I, I would say sign up for an institute. Okay, good idea, good idea. And maybe someday NYGBS will have an institute. That's on my wish list. That's right, that's right. <laughs> In case you hadn't come up with that idea, just suggesting that. Right. <laughs> uh, if you can recommend one book for our listeners, what would it be? You know what? Actually, I'm going to say uh, 
Professional Genealogy, the very first edition uh, by, edited by Elizabeth Schoen Mills. But we don't want to recommend the first edition, do we? I think it's fascinating to have a view of what the field was like at that time. All right. So, but I just want to say that people should also look at the second edition because it's updated to reflect changing technologies and things right, like right, that. Right, right, right. Absolutely. Okay. Don't just limit yourself to that that first edition. I don't know, maybe I should change that answer, but I, I still think it's amazing to look at what it was like at that point. Give our audience one parting piece of advice and then tell us how we can get in contact with you. I think it, it would only be that anything really is possible in genealogy, but find a focus, <laughs> find a focus. And you, you can, you can certainly just send me an email. Uh, it's josh at djoshuataylor.com. And I, I, I love to hear from other genealogists. So, so feel free to send me an email. Josh Taylor, thank you so much for coming on the Genealogy Professional Podcast. Th thanks for having me. Wow. There is so much to unpack from that discussion with Josh Taylor. But there are three main points that I'd like to focus on. First, networking. Did you notice the networking has been a constant throughout Josh's career? I went back and listened to the interview, and I discovered that Josh was utilizing and benefiting from networking right from the start. He was networking at conferences when he was in high school and college long before he was well known. If you listen closely, you'll notice that his job opportunities came about from previously established networking contacts. Second, Josh was industry and future focused. He didn't say, I like genealogy, how can I get a job in genealogy research? Instead, he said, where is the industry heading and how can I be a part of that? He has consistently looked forward all the while asking for advice from more experienced professionals about the direction he should take or how he should diversify his activities. Third, Josh set goals with intention. He decided what he wanted to do, networked to meet the people he needed to, and then made those goals happen. In addition, he pushed himself into new activities such as public speaking and allowed himself to get uncomfortable while he became proficient. We could talk for hours about Josh Taylor, but I'd really like you to focus on these points. Networking, consider the industry and its future, and setting goals with intention. How can you apply those to your genealogy journey and career? In news this week, as I mentioned last time, if you'd like to contribute to supporting the podcast, then I would ask, if it's possible, that you recommend me as a virtual speaker to your local library historical or genealogical society. Any money earned from speaking now goes directly to supporting the podcast. You can find more details about this in the show notes at thegenealogyprofessional.com. If you want to reach out to me and let me know how an episode impacted you, you can email me at contact at thegenealogyprofessional.com. You can also comment in the TGP Action Group on Facebook. And of course, don't forget you can now find the Genealogy Professional Podcast on Spotify and YouTube. That's it for this time. Until we meet again, keep improving your business skills and take at least one step to push your business forward. The Genealogy Professional Podcast is a production of Fieldstone Common Media. Copyright 2020. Executive Producer, Miriam Pierre-Louis. Creative Producer, George Edwards. Technical Director, Jean-Luc Pierre-Louis, Jr.